Grace and peace, everybody. Blessings to you. Do me a favor, as you come in, would you share this video with someone who needs a word from the Lord? And if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, would you please subscribe? And also, would you please make sure that when you come in, say hello. It'd be great to be able to speak with you today. Welcome as you come in. Um, I want to share with you all where I am in just a moment as you all come in. Good to see you, Shasha. I see you. Blessings uh, upon you. Tasha Bradley, good to see you. Blessings upon you. Shatera, I see you. Blessings upon you. Divine wisdom, blessings. I see you. Sharon, I see you. Blessings to you. Jessica, love, 511. It's good to see you. Blessings upon you. M. Watkins, good afternoon. And blessings to you. Natanya, I see you. Blessings. Joel, blessings to you. I see you. E.D. Lester, blessings to you. Jessica, if you want to follow me on my YouTube page, if it's easier for you, um, I, I have not gotten too comfortable with Twitter uh, either, but um, if that's where you want us to connect, stay there, somewhere where you can make sure you have a connection. I see you, Rochelle Bolton, prophetess, blessings to you, good to see you. Amber Bryant, I love you, Amber, blessings to you. May the hand of God continue doing something supernatural on your behalf in Jesus' name. Um, I am in Charleston, West Virginia, while well, I'm in Cross Lanes, which is a little city outside of Charleston, West Virginia. I am here for... Uh, an event called the Gathering of Eagles. Um, it is, um, my pastor um, has called us in to the city and um, just a certain number of us who the Lord laid on his heart for us to gather as a think tank. Um, and we have an eight point agenda for this week. Uh, I'm actually only going to be here through Wednesday, but the Lord is doing some really tremendous things. So I stepped out um, of a meeting to come to my car and sit with you all for a few moments so I can encourage you. Um, and also because you all hold such value. Here's my pastor. Hold, hold just a moment. Hold. I'm doing my Bible study. I'll be, I'll be back here. Like it's snowing. That's off the trees. I'll be back in a second. I'm doing Bible study. I'm doing my Bible study. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, that was my pastor. Um, um, I tipped out when he wasn't looking. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, he's, he's, that's, that's my man. Um, but I wanted to since spend some time with you all. Uh, you all hold such value um, to me um, because the Lord loves you. And um, I can't help but love you all as well. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you um, real quick so that you can uh, continue growing in your walk with God. Um I was talking to a dear friend of mine this morning and he was expressing to me, he may be on, he may be watching. Um, he was expressing to me some of the strategy that he has, he has had to incorporate uh, because how the enemy will try to send mental warfare even at the believer. And I was remarking to him how uh, there are so many people in the body of Christ that have been in mental warfare so long 
that they've learned to live in that space. They don't know that it's actually warfare. They don't even know that it's a battle. They've been in that condition just that long. They've accepted the condition. Uh, and it reminded me of the man who was at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. The Bible says that when Jesus came to, Jesus was going to heal him. But when Jesus, the Bible said Jesus knew he had been there a long time. And when he talked to the man, the man said, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. So he explained that there was one opportunity every year for somebody to be healed. And he had missed every opportunity. So he had gotten to a place where he was okay with the fact that maybe this is how I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And I was sharing with the prophet today, I said, the one thing that the Lord has made me understand is that you must possess your peace. You cannot, you cannot um, expect peace to exist. Meaning, there are people who believe that peace and tranquility are synonymous. They, they want uh, things to be you know, low-key and happy and everything goes well. But that's not true peace. True peace has to do with a wholeness. True peace has to be possessed. You, you, you have to process yourself as fighting to rest. You understand? As the Bible says, I see you, Sandra. I love you. Good to see you. The Bible says you labor to enter into rest. Okay, it is, it is a, uh, it is Paul's way in the New Testament of giving us a, an insight to the um, the commandment that God gives to Moses that says, "Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy." He's not just trying to tell you to be religious; he's telling you. To labor, he says, "You six days shall you labor, and on the seventh day you'll rest. What he's literally saying is, work so you can rest. Work so you can rest. So peace carries with it the implication of war. Watch. You cannot... Uh, you cannot subtract war for it, uh, it, that, that it takes to get to peace. For instance, if the United States of America enters into war, the objective is not to fight. The objective is peace. You hear me? So you have to learn how to fight to get to your peace. There's, there's a few other strategies that the Lord gave me that I want to give this to you now. It's called living out of your reservoir. Um, the Bible tells us, and you all know this story well, you know it better than I do, I'm sure some of you can out-preach me uh, hands down with this story. But the Bible tells us uh, the story of Joseph. Remember all that Joseph had to go through, how his brothers uh, hated him because he was a dreamer. Let's, let's make this a little more clear. They didn't hate him because he was a dreamer. They hated him because they were not as high, as exalted in his dreams than he was or as he was. So let me help you. People won't hate you because you dream. People will hate you because you dream of yourself being better than them. Now, I need you to possess this today. You cannot, listen, you cannot remain in an argument with the purpose of God on your life. Let me let me let me let me backtrack one 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 click here. I was studying. Uh, I'm reading. I'm reading this book. Uh, it's called the Ten Commandments. Looking at the commandments through the ancient world picture, uh, pictures. And of course, we all know the Ten Commandments or heard of the Ten Commandments. But when you study the Ten Commandments, you find out the Ten Commandments aren't really commandments as much as they are realities. 
They are meant to be 10 realities. They, there, there, there is a, it is, it is how God orchestrated and maintained covenant relationship with his bride, the children of Israel. So it's a covenant arrangement, the Ten Commandments. It's a covenant arrangement. The very first part of the covenant has to do with keeping God first. It's the first commandment. And it has to do with keeping God or making God and his name first. Don't take it for granted. Keep his name holy. All right. Now, in that commandment, what is literally being said is simply this. Make him first in everything. But watch this. First does not just mean to have the position of Somebody is after you, so you're in the front of them. It also means to make him superior. Now, how does that work? Well, the superiority of God is not necessarily based in how he reveals himself to you. It is based in your understanding of him, which means when a bill comes and the money's not there, even though the money's not there, the bill doesn't become superior to God. Do you hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, the lights might get turned off. Yeah, they may repossess the car. This is what we've done now. We've placed God's goodness above God. So when he hasn't done what we think is good, he's no longer superior. Now, the, that word that that in that commandment that talks about God being superior, there is a letter that is used where God calls himself Alpha. Alpha does not only mean first, it means hero, it means leader. It, it actually carries with it, it denotes one who leads you into battle with a security of victory. I am Alpha. I'm I'm the leader. Right. And and so so but this is this is a concept of God. It may not be your experience. It is your concept. So what happened before before uh, Joseph had a an experience, he had a dream. I need you to catch this. And what he did was he would not allow other people's disposition of him change his dream. This is how you possess peace. I hope you all are ready. He did not allow the people who said, oh, you think you're better than me? The people who said, what? You better than even your dad? Better than your mother? You better, you better, you better? Because Joseph wasn't trying to be better than anybody. It was not a competition for him. He was just trying to be what it was God gave him the dream to be. See, here's the thing. The enemy is not threatened by you dreaming. He's threatened if you believe the dream. He's threatened when you say, oh, I caught a glimpse of who God created me to be. Now I'm going to possess it. So Joseph goes forth uh, in his dream. And I want, you to, I want you to catch how this plays out. Joseph does nothing but dream. Then he shares his dream. He articulates his dream. Because his dream is from God, and here's the part that you have to really be prepared for. When your dream is of God, God might use hands that you don't think should play a part in your dream. He also may cause those hands to put you in something or some place or posture that you think does not play into the fulfillment of that divine purpose all your life. So here, Joseph is a dreamer, dreaming great things, but he's being thrown now in this, uh, he's, he's now being thrown down into this cave and, 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 and there's a lie that he's dead. You know how, you know how the story went. They sell him into slavery. Now I want you to catch this. Everywhere that Joseph went while he was in slavery, his dream kept him alive. Because he always had a dream that somehow he would survive everything. He was always in possession of his peace concerning his dream. It's already done. It's already finished. Now, whatever my fight is, whatever whatever strategies I've got to go 
uh, uh, through and put up with in order for this thing to come to fruition. I'll go through that, but I'm going to possess this thing in the end. Going to hold it. Watch what happens. So you all understand how the story goes. Eventually, Pharaoh has a dream that he cannot interpret. Now watch. While in slavery, Joseph went from dreaming to interpreting dreams. While enslaved, while imprisoned, while people who uh, loved him were nowhere near him. Under stressful sets of circumstances, uh, a situation that was not under his control, he, I'm certain, would have chosen a different strategy. But because he understood that labor comes before rest, or labor is how you enter into peace, he understood that this is a step that is necessary. Now, I want to talk to those of you who are in some level of struggle today. The struggle is not there to make you believe that you're out of the will of God. The struggle is there because you must labor to get to peace. You hear me? It's not just going to fall into your lap. I wish I wish there was a better way for certain things to happen. That time when we were told that you could name it and claim it, I really wish that name it and claim it actually had some credibility. But let me just tell you this. You can name it all you want to. You can claim it all you want to. But to possess it, you got to go get it. Do you hear me? I don't care where it is. If you're going to possess it, you got to go get it. You're not going to just call this thing to you. You got to go get it. This is why I tell you what I mean. You may not have to physically go get it, but the moment you receive a promise, the moment you put your uh, mindset in a place where you believe that what God said to you is coming to pass, you're going to get into some kind of mental warfare. The enemy is going to tease you with it. And when I say the enemy, I don't necessarily mean the devil. There's going to be a teasing with it. You, some days you're going to wake up feeling like the day is the day. And some days you'll wake up feeling, I wish this wasn't the day. You, you know, you, you're, you're, you're going to have those moments of up and down. But listen to me. You have to learn this one secret. Don't just speak to the thing you want. Learn how to also speak to the thing in you that's telling you it's not coming to pass. That is your thought process. You got to learn how to take authority over those thoughts and pull them down. It's time out for us uh, going to get counseling over something that by the Holy Spirit, we have the authority to dethrone. Let's get to this. So Joseph, is, Joseph has gone from dreaming to interpreting dreams while in prison. He was in prison, but his gift still grew. Did you catch that? So finally, Pharaoh tells him about the dream. Seven years this happened and seven years that happened and this, this, and he tells him about all the things that happened. And I want you to catch what Joseph does. Joseph does not just interpret the dream. Joseph comes up with a strategy so that the dream which is a warning, which is a, uh, a a premonition, we could call, so that that dream doesn't end up bringing destruction. So he comes up with a plan, and in the plan, Joseph made a reservoir. He allowed during the times when things were great, he didn't eat all the corn. He didn't make sure that he they, he didn't let them eat all the wheat. He said, we're going to eat some and we're going to keep some back for the dry season. Listen to me. We're going to eat some and we're going to keep some back for the dry season. Here is what many believers have not learned to do. You haven't used wisdom concerning your joy. You haven't used wisdom concerning the season of breakthrough. When God sends you a season of breakthrough, you squander all of your breakthrough in that season. And so when that season of breakthrough is over, you go from a high to a low because while you were high, you didn't say nothing. 
You didn't learn that the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. You learned how to shake hands, high five, shout, run, speak in tongues, leap up and down, scream, tell somebody how good God is. You learned all those things, but nobody told you that there's going to come a day when you need to tap into a reservoir and you got to learn to live off of something God did for you years ago. You got to learn how to be happy with something God did for me three years ago. He did it. Now watch this. What does living out of the reservoir do? Living out of the reservoir reminds me of what God can do. Did you hear me? Because when you are in a drought, the enemy makes you have amnesia when you're in a drought. You don't, you don't, it's like somehow you forgot. Remember this, the Bible, the Bible talks uh, in the book of Psalms, it, it, it talks about how when the children of Israel were in bondage, uh, the, 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 the Egyptians said, sing to us one of your songs. And they said, how can we sing in a strange land? And the Bible said they hung their harps up on the willow tree. In other words, their praise could not make it while they were in their prison. They, 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 they somehow could only praise God when things were going well. Are you hearing me? And the reason why most of us can only praise God when things are going well is because we don't know that he's our hero. We just think that in terms of uh, if he's not doing something expressive right now, if he hasn't showed himself this year, then we forget that. What about that time when I was about to take my life because of depression? And uh, for some reason, I kept getting blocked. I couldn't buy the pills. I, I took some pills, but they weren't enough. Whatever the situation was, when you don't know how to live out of your reservoir, what happens is this current situation will make you forget what God brought you through already. Joseph would not allow that. Joseph said, there's going to be seven years of drought. So let's hold on to some overflow so that when the drought comes, there's still food for us to eat. Let me just say this to you. Some of you all right now, I see at least five of you all whose names I'm able to see going up in the comments. At least five of you all are in a certain set of circumstances right now where there's a urgent uh, set of dilemmas uh, or situations that have come up on you. What the enemy wants you to do right now is he wants you to live in the drought off of nothing. He wants you to forget that the Lord is good. He wants you to forget that this mercy is everlasting. He wants you to forget that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the reason why you can forget all of that is because when God was providing for you, you didn't hold fast to any leftovers. Listen, something I want you to understand about Jesus. First of all, Jesus, the Bible lets us know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The, 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 the word Bethlehem, that first word Beth, that first part of that word Beth, uh, it means bread. It, it means bread. So Bethlehem is the house of bread. It means literally the house of bread. Jesus was born in the house of bread. There's a reason why Jesus was born and, 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 and he's born in the house of bread because he is the bread of life. Watch this. He's the bread of life. Now, so when Jesus performs miracles with bread involved, he always multiplied the bread. Good God help me today. <laughs> he either broke it, blessed it, or multiplied it or gave it. He was always doing something with the bread to make sure that there was enough left over. So when the man, who, the lad who had the two fish and the five loaves of bread, when Jesus finished feeding everybody, what did the Bible say? The Bible said they took up 12 baskets of leftovers. The leftovers are for the time when nobody shows up with fish. The leftover is for the time when the organist doesn't come to church and they don't sing your favorite song, but you still got a praise in your heart. The leftovers is for that time period 
when friends and family members walk out on you and don't acknowledge you and don't uphold you and don't undergird you and don't cover you, but still you understand that God said that he will be with me even to the end of the age. See, that's when you have to live out of a reservoir. I don't have anything happening today that makes me want to clap my hands and run and leap. But I remember something God did last year. You got to learn how to keep a reservoir stashed back that every now and then, when I can't see something to thank him for now, I thank him for what he did back then. Joseph saw it coming. So he built a reservoir. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What's your strategy for when the enemy tries to keep you living in depression? If your strategy is counsel alone, not I'm not saying counseling is bad, you understand. But if your strategy is counsel alone, believer, if your strategy is just sitting in the room by yourself, thinking through things alone, if that's the only part of your strategy, what will happen is eventually your strategy is going to fail because you'll be looking for something to, to, to find a song to sing about and you won't have any. And, be, and be like the children of Israel, you'll hang your heart on the willow tree. And they said, how can we sing the Lord's song while we're in this strange land? I'm here to tell you the way to sing a song in a strange land is to have the song in your heart and not just in your instruments. The song doesn't have to be. Let me tell you, I was looking at an old video that I did some years ago, maybe even six years ago or so. In the video, I was sitting down at my keyboard and I was just singing. Nobody there, just singing to the Lord uh, out of my heart. Now, I'm not the best musician in the world and neither am I the best singer in the world, but the Lord loves my voice. The Lord loves my song. Do you hear me? So I give him what he loves. Watch this. This is what your Bible says. The Bible tells you that God inhabits praise. I want you to listen. When you study the Hebrew language terminology, you understand that in the Hebrew, words aren't just words that have definition. The word actually takes on a personality or personification. In Hebrew, the word inherit, inhabit rather, means to be married to without the ability to divorce. It means to be in covenant with. So when the Bible says that the Lord inhabits praise, it means he's married to praise and he won't divorce it. I don't know if you caught the revelation yet. But this is the reason why the first thing that a test or that a issue that comes up in your life tries to steal from you is joy. Because if it'll steal your joy, it will take your praise. And if it will take your praise, there's nothing that God will show up for because he shows up for his bride. He's married to, cannot divorce, praise. I need you to catch that. So that's why the enemy steals your praise. That's why you can't praise God because there's money in the bank. You can't praise God because there's son in, in your relationship. My relationship is sunny. Thank you. You can't praise him for that. You got to praise him for being God. So that when there is no son, you got a reservoir with some praise left over in it because I'm not praising him because of the set of circumstances. I'm praising him because he can. Even if he doesn't, I know he can because he's done things that nobody else but him could have done for me before. Do you hear me? Listen, I want you I need you. If you're going to be successful as a believer, you need to start building a reservoir. You need to start having some leftovers. You need to start having some part of your relationship with God that you don't need him to do anything today. If he don't, if he don't open another door, the doorway that he opened to get you out of sin, that you were on your way to hell, that door that he opened right there should be enough to get you to praise him. I know this is uh, uh, Habakkuk talks about though there be no uh, corn in the barn, right? Though, though all these things happen, I'm still 
I'm still going to give God praise. You got to get to a place where your praise is not connected to the current issue, whether it's good or bad. You got to get to that place. Joseph, the Egyptians had corn and wheat and everything. Watch this. When the entire rest of the earth was in a drought, Egypt had food because one man saw the need for a reservoir. Do you hear me? You got to learn how to live out of your reservoir. You got to have a space in your relationship with God that is not reflective of what's going on in my current set of circumstances because your current set of circumstances could be the pits right now. But what you got to understand is that God is looking for somebody that will even take praise to the pit. They threw Daniel down in the pit. Did you hear me? They threw Daniel in the pit. They had him down in the, di in the, in the lion's den. But the lions couldn't do nothing with Daniel because Daniel knew God. It's too late to try to figure out that God is a lifesaver when the lion is roaring at you. You got to praise him like he's a lifesaver when you don't need a boat when you don't need a car, when you don't need a house, when you don't need a payment, you got to get to a place where you say he's first. He's alpha. He's alpha. He's alpha. He's first. He's superior. He's leader. He's hero. So I'm going to treat him like that even in this process that I'm in and watch what happens. Did you hear me? Watch what happens. If you take more grace to you, Lady Key, I see you. If you learn to take praise to the pit, your praise will turn the pit to a palace. Did you hear me? Because God is married to, without the ability to divorce, praise. That's your word. He inhabits praise. So find a reservoir. Build a reservoir. Don't, don't waste all of your joy because you're happy. Woo, 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 woo. Let me tell you about woo, woo. Well, No, there's going to come a time when you're not going to feel that. Woo, woo, woo. Every now and then, you need to stack some of that up. Stack some of that up. Let me tell you, uh, have you all ever seen, there's a show, um, I think it's called Hoarders, uh, and or something to that effect. Uh, I watched maybe a couple of weeks ago, somebody told me about it. So I, um, I don't know, maybe it was on Netflix or something. So I watched it. I watched a couple of of the um, shows, it's a series. And so when I was watching it, there were two things that I noticed. Number one, I noticed that the person who was a hoarder, all of them said the same things, sort of. They all thought that there was gonna come a time when they could use what they kept. What if, you know, some something come up and I need a, I have it. So they were holding on to something they didn't need today for the possibility that a situation may arise when I needed another day. Let me say this to you. Hold on to your joy. Hold on to your peace. The next time you feel, and this happens to us believers, there are times when you feel a surge of the Holy Spirit coming over you. When the surge of the Holy Spirit comes over you, hold on to some of it. Don't just speak in tongues and pass out. Don't fall out on the floor and roll around. Hold on to some of that. I'm going to need some of this because I got to go home and deal with a relationship that's not reflecting God right now. I'm going to need some of this because I have some kids that aren't living like they're supposed to live. I'm going to need some of this because I'm attending a church where they're kind of dry. I'm going to need to hold on because this is what I want you to take this to the bank. There is going to come a time and a season in your life where you are not bearing fruit. I don't care if it's because you are in seed time or if you're in a drought. But during that time, you don't want the sense of circumstances to kill you. It killed my joy. It killed my peace. It killed my, you don't want it to kill you. You got to have leftovers. They took up 12 baskets of leftovers when Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish. They took leftovers 
12 baskets, the number of disciples, 12, the number of foundation, 12. They took 12. Listen, this is a this has got to become a part of the foundational practice of you as a believer. I'm not going to get caught in a drought and not have what I need. Because you're going to you're going to experience droughts in life. L- listen, have you ever I know you have had this happen. Have you ever has it ever appeared to you like your joy was stolen overnight? Like yesterday, you were just happy. Praise God, everything was good. And something happened. And the following day, it knocks all the joy out of you. That's when you need a reservoir. That's when you need to say, well, that didn't work. I I would have liked that to work. It didn't work. All right. But my joy, all my joy is not stashed over there. I got some joy over here in God's resume. Let me tell you what I used to do. This is this was something I used to do at our at our uh, one of our older churches when we were uh, we birthed out some churches in, in, in Huntsville, Alabama. This is one of the things I used to do. We used to have nearly every week. We used to have what I call flashback praise, and a flashback praise was when we thought of something that God did in the past. And we use this as our key scripture. The Bible talks about how God was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the Bible says that when the children got to the Red Sea, they couldn't go any further. (laughs) So what the Holy Ghost did was he blocked Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army from being able to pursue them until a way was made in front of them. I need you to catch this. So when the Red Sea opened up, they walked across on dry ground. You all know the story. When they got to the other side, now Pharaoh is no longer blocked. He's able to run into that same door that God opened for the children of Israel. He's trying to pursue them, to catch them, to kill them, or to bring them back to slavery. And the Bible said that the Red Sea closed upon them. And it says, Sarah, I'm sorry, it says that, um, Lord help me, Moses' sister, you all, you all, uh, right in my brain just took a total pause. (laughs) Miriam, thank you, Holy Spirit. Miriam pulled out her tambourine and her and the women began to praise God. From right there, this was a praise for what God did for what was behind them. Pharaoh was chasing them, coming up from the rear, but God stopped it. Some of you have got to learn how to praise God for something he did in your past. I know, let, let's, 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 let's just for a minute reach past the blood for a minute. Let's reach past even your salvation for a minute. There were some things that God didn't allow to happen to you that should have happened to you. Some of us should have broke jails wide open. We should have and bust hell wide open too. There's so many things that God prevented us from experiencing. Situations just like other people. And for other people, it didn't work out. But somehow it worked out for you. You need to pull out a tambourine and dance for that thing a flashback praise. He may not be doing it now, but because he did it then, I still got some leftover praise for you. I saved a thank you because I know what kind of God you are. Your resume will make me praise you. Yeah. So get a reservoir, church. Some of you, again, I can see. uh, I, 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 I see Carrie, my child came in. Excuse me, careful calling my child. My child, my daughter came in. It's good to see you. Um, I love you. I see those of you who, who, who are coming in. And I see also those of you who the enemy is trying to steal. Listen, listen. What's the Bible say? The thief, the thief. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his job. Now, do you think that the enemy is trying to only steal carnal things from you? Do you think he's just trying to steal your money? Do you think he's just trying to steal your marriage or steal your home or make you lose your car? No. 
he steals those things to come for your joy, to come for your praise. He steals those things because he's really trying to intercept your relationship with God so that you be in a drought complaining because it's not raining. So you'll be in a drought complaining because, Lord, I did so much. Lord, I tried. Lord, I gave. Lord, when the people asked, I did everything I could. And look at me now. Here I am. He wants you to be in that position where you have nothing to tap into for being grateful or to show him, Lord, I still trust you. That's what he wants. So when you see the enemy coming into your life to steal, what do you have to do now? You got to go into your reservoir and pull out some praise for something God already did, some, something that's already finished. See, this is how, this is one of the reasons why God has allowed me to move from being a person who praises him to a person who has appraised him and has given him a worth, which causes me to worship, worthship. You can only worship God when you establish a value to him. As long as his value is based on your current circumstance, you won't ever be able to appraise him because your appraisal will always be based on the situation. For instance, let me just make this as natural and carnal as I can. I'm going to let you all go. I got to get back inside. So there was a city outside of Atlanta. Well, it's actually a part of Atlanta. It's called Decatur. Uh, some of y'all may have heard it talks about he said Decatur, where's greater? All right. Well, uh, in Decatur, uh, there were some homes in this specific area, a uh, depressed area of Decatur. There were some homes that you could pay uh, $20,000, $25,000 and buy the houses. Well, they were boarded up. Some of them, you know, dilapidated about to fall over. So there weren't a lot of people buying them because who wants to invest in something dilapidated and about to fall down? Well, because there was a, a plan that Atlanta had where they were bringing in a new uh, uh, system of transportation called the Beltway, Everybody wanted to be on the Beltway. Well, find out that these pieces of property were on the Beltway. So what happened? Well, this is what happened. Directly across the street from the $20,000 and $25,000 dilapidated homes, somebody started tearing down houses and building $400,000 houses. Somebody with vision, hear me, went into a pit and built a palace. What do you think that made happen? Well, glad you asked. What it made happen was it made the value increase because they put something beautiful around things that were not. Let me just say this to you. The value of the place where you are, I don't care if it's a good place or a bad place. If you want the value to go up, you got to hear that the belt line is coming. When you hear that the belt line is coming, you are in advance with the information. So you already know that Jesus is coming. You already know he's a deliverer. You already know he's not going to leave you. He said, I won't leave you. You already know that even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's with you. You already know these things. So what do you do? Let me go ahead and praise him while I'm in this back alley, bad, backward situation. Because when I praise him, he inhabits the praise. God will move into that situation if you just give him some praise. So what's this mean? This means that sometimes you have to go into a bad place and paint it with praise till the Holy Ghost shows up. You have to get some wallpaper and put the wallpaper up until the Holy Spirit shakes the foundation. You have to sweep them carpets until God comes through and does something new for you living out the reservoir. You can't let you can't let how it looks today 
be whether or not you praise God. Do you hear me? Don't don't let today be the genesis of your praise. Let his lordship, let his ability, let his power, let the dream that he put in your heart be the reason. Even when nothing is growing, you still got praise because the word in your heart has never lost potential to produce the power to which it was intended to produce in your life. Do you hear me? Listen, I love you all. I thank God for each of you. I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you today. Those of you who have been allowing the news, the, I'm not talking about TV. I'm talking about the things going on in your life. You've been allowing those sets of circumstances to dictate, to be the orchestrator of your worship or praise or song. Let me tell you something. Sing a song in a strange land and watch what happens. Shh. Call on the name of Jesus in darkness. Watch what happens. I need you to hear me. We sometime, I, and maybe the Lord will allow me to do this. And, 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 and let me let me interject this here. Um, I talked to I talked to several of my friends. I'm, as a matter of fact, there's about thirty of us, twenty of us or so, um, that are you know having these meetings. Um, and one of the things that I we I was sharing, um, I had this. Uh, it, I don't want to call it so much an issue, but God and I have been talking about a specific thing as it relates to me, and I'll, I'm going to share it with you all. There is a deeper understanding of God that I've been given than sometime what I'm allowed to share teaching, uh, as far as teaching. And so Often I would say to Lord, well, Lord, you know, there's some deeper things I want to teach about you. And this Lord reminded me of this again uh, Saturday, I think it was. That's what he told me. He said, there are people who will never be free because what we've done is we've introduced to them an intellectual God. And they will never get free because they cannot attain to the level that is necessary to understand God intellectually because God cannot be intellectually understood. I don't care what you read. God has to be a revelation. Did you hear me? I don't care what book you pick up, including the Bible. Listen. There are people who have read the Bible from front cover to the back cover and closed the Bible and still didn't get God because God is a revelation. So I was talking to God. I was saying, God, you know, there's some Hebrew, there's some things, some, some Hebrew words that I wanted to go over with you all, like what, what, what alpha means, and just so that you all would have maybe more of a foundation of when you talk to God, this is who you're talking to. He said to me, he said, you teach them me by revelation. And I will impress into their spirit who I am and cause them to have a certain mindset about me. But you speak to their spirit. So I stopped complaining. You all forgive me. I love you all. <laughs> but I was complaining because, you know, I, I wanted to share with you all a little more of what I know, if that makes sense. Um, but he said, no, stay right here because I need their spirits to come to a certain place in revelation. And then I'll give them a certain mindset. So let me say this to you. Fall all the way over on God's ability. Fall all the way over on it. Don't, don't stand there trying to lean in your own intellect or understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. That's scripture, okay? How about this? The Bible says it's not by might, nor is it by power, but it is by my spirit. So God does things that you and I will never be able to explain. He doesn't want us to be able to explain it. He wants us to catch it. He wants us to receive it. That's how you got to get it. 
by faith. You got to catch it. You got to receive it. So here's the challenge. I want you to sit down and I really, really want you to do this. And I don't know how many uh, uh, of you all will follow this instruction. Hopefully all of you. I want you to sit down and I want you to write out maybe five to 10 things that God has already done for you in the past. And I want you to find some time to praise him for those things. And watch this. As you are praising God for what he's already done, watch God show up and start doing the next things that you need him to do. Guarantee that's how he works. I guarantee it. That's how he works. Praise me according to my excellent greatness. Then he says, uh, praise me according to my acts. There's two different levels of praise. First, you praise him at the level that he is able. Then you praise him at the level of what he did. So that's what I want you to do. Spend some time. Write it down if you have to. Even if you got to write down something that happened when you were 17 or eight years old, whatever. Write down. And just start thanking God for that. Just start thanking him where you could have gone if, if that thing would have played out the way that the enemy wanted it to. And watch what happens. When he shows up, he always shows out. Listen, I love you all. Got to go. I thank God that my pastor, Bishop Apostle <laughs> Mosley, uh, allowed me. Uh, I've been with you all 50, almost 52 minutes. So I'm going to go back in here. Um Pray for us. This one of the things we're, we're uh, intent to do today. Um, the Lord has really been dealing with us about how important it is that people um, get the right mindset and how important the psychology of salvation is, uh, which is why Paul says you get the helmet of salvation. He don't even talk about salvation as it relates to your heart. He talks about salvation as it relates to your head. And this that's because all of the warfare that you and I face is based in how we think. And it's usually based in two characters. It's what we think about ourselves and it's what we think about God. And that's why most of us lose wars or battles because we think too small of both ourselves and God. The Bible says, if God be for us, if God be for us, one scripture says, who can be against us? And another says, he is more than the world against us. Let, let's just make sure we tap into that. All right. Listen, you all have a fantastic day. Uh, if we don't get a chance to share any more before the week is out, have an incredible week. Let God show you how good he's already been so that your praise won't be hinged on his next thing. It'll be praise. Your praise is hinged on how great he already is. And that will motivate the sets of circumstances you're in to turn things into the pathway where the breakthrough is coming for you. All right. Take care of yourselves. Let's talk again soon. All right. Bye.